Welcome to my channel, KC. That's me, Carrie Chug, the Sledge Storyteller. And I'm here to talk about the wonderful world of storytelling and open up discussion about how we can tell the best stories we possibly can. So for this video, I decided to go over the several literary and pop culture characters that have fallen into public domain. These are the ones that I've specifically picked, which I want to see make a comeback because of their visual story potential and that they haven't got much attention in recent years. Because I currently am on my own expensive project, I can only put this out with an open invitation for someone else to take the step to embrace that challenge and create a story from these old properties. Now, public domain comes into play under several conditions. Any intellectual property created in 1924 or before is now fair game for anyone who wants to make their own stories from it. Also, fair game is property where the copyright wasn't renewed. It, they allowed it to lapse. One thing that requires discretion, though, is that any public domain property with a book or a movie based on it after 1924 and copyright was renewed continually will factor in that it can't be used or copied by anybody else. And I have to admit that this is no new publishing venture, most notably Dynamite Comics. They started picking up several characters who copyright had run out, such as Black Terror, Zorro, John Carter of Mars, and the Death Defying Devil. Now, Death Defying Dev Devil, he was originally called Daredevil. Of course, they had to change that because Marvel had picked that name up in the 60s. Get on with it! I get it. You've been getting no love for many decades, Lou, and I promise you that you get to be first. I want you to gain some new love, and to ensure that, I just needed to create context. Oh. So first, uh, Fred Parrish, alias Blue Bolt. Originally published by Novelty Press under the title Blue Bolt Comics, created by Joe Simon, who picked up artist Jack Kirby and published its first issue in 1940, this the year before that same duo is, uh, they're famous for creating Captain America. But uh, the character continued until a Novelty Press in uh, 1949, sold the publication to Star Publications, and they continued with him until they stopped in 1953. Nothing published on him since then, but Blue Bolt's story goes that he was a college football star struck by lightning during practice. He then boarded a plane to seek help, and the plane was struck by a second bolt of lightning. A scientist found him afterward and gave him treatment using radium, and Parrish recovered and gained the power to project lightning from his body and took up a gun that shot, also shot lightning. Why he needed two forms of lightning, I don't know. His first arch foe was the Green Sorceress, and then the next year, uh, with the outbreak of World War II, like so many other heroes of their area, era, he fought Nazis. But with such electric-powered heroes as Static, Black Lightning, and Shazam, it remains a popular power, and uh, largely because writers, they're learning more about what can be done with electricity and the, the practical side of using, implementing that, than what was implemented in the 1940s. And on that scientific front, electricity manipulation also means you can magnetize metal. So plenty of potential there to use magnetism as a weapon. So somebody pick him up. My turn. Yes, Green Mask, it's your turn. So says, who wrote Green Mask is uncertain, but the artwork what we know was done by Walter Frame. He was published by Fox Publications under the title Mystery Men Comics in 1939. And that title continued until 1942. Green Mask's public identity wasn't revealed until 1940, and up until then, his identity was withheld from the audience, though a reporter, uh, News Dokes, like, he was later called News Blake, was the one person who was privy. Once his identity was revealed, it was established that it was Michael Shelby, and he was a wealthy private investigator. His father had been a senator who had been murdered over his aggressive agendas, by a, a white hooded gangster, gangster gang part they were called the Grim Circle. Initially, Shelby had no superpowers. He was just a Batman type on the streets. He became superpowered when he was exposed to an experimental Vita Ray machine that had been created by a fellow good guy named Professor Lascom. The exposure gave him powers of superhuman strength and flight. So far, he sounds like Superman, though, depending on the plot. He sometimes had invulnerability. He also sometimes used a paralyzer gun. Two years after Michael Shelby's cancellation, Fox Publications reintroduced Green Mask as Johnny Green, the son of a never-portrayed Green Mask, Walter Green. 
Johnny will first remind us of Spider-Man because of his public identity of a meek teenager with glasses who gets kicked around by the jocks in high school. But he becomes Green Mask when he sees injustices, and then he gets angry and screams, Eow! So, pretty much a hybrid of the Incredible Hulk and the guy we now call Shazam. And one inconsistency is sometimes like what is commonly like the Hulk. Johnny doesn't remember what he did as Green Mask, and sometimes it was a dream, and sometimes he was fully aware of what he did. So, should you choose to take this character on, you can choose between two cool Green Masks. And then the second one, you can choose how Johnny recalls what he did. But like electric powers, there are several Superman clones out there. So there's room for one more and another Hulk type, uh, Hulk type specifically, can be a lot of fun as well. Me now. Of course, Pat, and maybe it should have been ladies first. But do notice that Pat's image is one you never see on the side of a football helmet. And I say that because this hero's moniker is Pat Patriot. Uh, first published in 1941 in issue number two of Daredevil Comics by Lev Gleason, and initially written by Charles Bureau and Bob Wood. Artist is uncertain, but her stories continued until 1942. The story goes that Patricia Patrios had just gotten fired from a job on an assembly line. That same night, she acted in an amateur stage production wearing a female form of Uncle Sam costume, after the show ended while still in costume, she walked past the factory uh, where she had just gotten fired from with her boyfriend, Mike, Mike Brown. And they were approached by a thug who threatened them if they didn't stay away, but Patricia made sure work of the guy and in turn uh, shut down a racket that involved smuggling airplane engines to the Axis Power headed by the factory foreman who fired her. The news of her exploit garbled her name to Pat Patriot, and from there, she continued in the war on the home front. Now, American patriotism is not the same thing now that it was back in the 1940s. And the fervor nowadays is essentially a call for more patriotic action and not only to hinge it on a ritual. Captain America still remains in his Stars and Stripes garb, so that doesn't have to be an outmoded costume motif. But I think an agenda against present-day hate crime under the context of that being anti-American would be an engaging adaptation and keeping her blue color background uh, will help connect with middle America. Lots of potential there. Now, me. All right, Bronze, I had plans to cover you. And update me. I'm with you 100% on that. So, the Bronze Terror is widely regarded as the first Native American superhero. And I know I'm walking on age, eggs with this in light of current cancel culture, with a lot of emphasis on Native American stereotypes. So much so that I don't even hear NFL analysts refer to the Washington football team and their old mascot name when talking about that team in the past, unlike the Titans as the Oilers in their days prior to that name change. But I didn't approach this without making sure about things by reading up on the matter in social discussion by those inside the demographic to get a good grasp on uh, what expectations Native Americans now have whenever featured in stories. Hence, uh, those readings are linked below the description. And this debut story in the same issue as Pat Patriot uh, in Daredevil Comics number two, written and drawn by Dick Briefer and uh, ran the same length of time. But uh, full blood Apache uh, Jeff Dixon had just finished his law school and came back to uh, his reservation in Arizona to find out that his father, Chief White Falcon, had been framed for murder. He, in turn, dons the identity of the Bronze Terror and makes use of his sheer athleticism, high level of combat skills, bow and arrow, and horsemanship to bring the real culprits to justice. Now, the Bronze Terror images I show, uh, they won't work in, uh, in a story for today because it has stereotype written all over it. And contemporary Native Americans mostly dress like mainstream America, and so a basic tactical costume may be in order. And because the Apache still have their own culture, educating yourself on that is an absolute must with a focus on how it relates to other cultures today. So one point of parallel reference I think is helpful is the CW TV show Black Lightning. It has a wonderful balance of inter-ethnic relations and uh, carries a great depiction of African Americans dealing with the opposition both inside and outside their demographic. But, you know, a creator with Apache roots may be the most appropriate one to bring this forth. 
but I would love to see this story told with the right cultural balance. So yes, lastly, Thor. Now, most people are aware that the Marvel Comics character is based on a demigod from ancient Norse mythology, so that alone is public domain. What, you may, what may surprise you is that Marvel's isn't the first attempt at making him a superhero. The first was by MLJ Publications with their three-issue title, Top Notch Comics, created by Otto and Jack Bender in 1939. Here, Thor is picked up by time travelers who also pick up an Egyptian princess named Elda, and they all take action as time-traveling warriors. Then there's Fox, Fox Publications' Thor, which was published in 1940, 1940 under the title Weird Comics for five issues and was created by Wright Lincoln. Here, the Viking god Thor endows his power onto mortal Grant Farrell, and he in turn flies, throws lightning bolts, creates storms, and wields the trademark hammer. Now, surprisingly in 2011, obviously capitalizing on Marvel's Thor getting released that same year, Production companies Dudez Production and Tomcat Films made a movie with the Fox uh, Grant Farrell Thor, at least with that name. The mood movie is titled Thunderstorm, The Return of Thor, and you just watch the trailer on YouTube and you'd have no idea this was supposed to be Thor since he wears high-tech armor, so maybe Iron Thor. But finally, Charlton Comics published Out of This World, number 11, and create and. Uh, this Thor was created by future Spider-Man co-creator Steve Ditko in 1959, only three years before Marvel came up with their Thor. But uh, this version of Thor was a, a sickly man of ancient Scandinavia when, uh, and when he entered a glowing cave that bathed him in magic rays, that gave him superhuman strength. And there was also a, uh, a hammer-shaped rock there with all those familiar Mjolnir powers. Now, in the case of all three of those versions of Thor, uh, their copyright ran out, so you could uh, tell a story using either of them. But the story I want to see told is uh, to once again go back to Thor's Norse mythology roots. Go, go back to ancient Scandinavia, have him uh, front and center among the Norse demigods under Odin, and tell the story about the war against the enemy giants with uh, the inhabitants of the earth in danger or a new spin on Ragnarok. Besides the aforementioned movie with uh, the Grant Farrell Thor, there was another 2011 movie produced by the Asylum Productions. It was called Almighty Thor, and it aired on the Sci-Fi Channel. And anyone familiar with the Asylum Production uh, knows to expect it to be schlocky. And you know they made Sharknado, and and haven't uh, seen that same Almighty Thor movie. Yes, expect that. It does start out in ancient Scandinavia, but goes the same plot route as the 1987 Masters of the Universe movie with Dolph Lundgren as He-Man, he -Man, being going into present day. So I dare say that even the Asylum uh, would even admit that it doesn't count. But those are the public domain characters I have. Uh, I see potential in being revived to, uh, into stories for today. What about me? this video please click like if you like this channel please click subscribe or follow me on instagram news of the pandemic has become depressing as of late but at least there's news that the vaccine is on the horizon in the meantime everyone be safe and god bless